Welcome to the Debris Monitoring Training Series. This series is designed to provide an overview of debris monitoring, no matter the experience level. This training is provided by the Public Assistance Training and Development Branch. This is video two of a six-part series. What will we be covering in this video? Right-of-way debris removal, hand-loaded trucks and trucks with no tailgates, truck certifications, debris load ticket, automatic debris monitoring systems, sample electronic debris load tickets. Right-of-way debris. This is a picture of right-of-way debris removal. You're going to have a community that doesn't always separate debris. They'll do their best. That's the hard part of the contract hauler's job and the coordination from you as the applicant with your public works department in the landfill and the operation perhaps at the temporary debris site reduction area. How are we going to separate this to be efficient and with respect to any environmental, local, state, environmental walls that we have and in coordination with the landfill? Maybe you can just take all of the debris to the landfill and they will separate it. We do not know. Often, emergency managers will ask the community to separate debris as they push it to the curb. That's great because you get volunteers and homeowners to help themselves in the community aid in the recovery of the debris removal process. Here, you'll see vegetative debris and construction and demolition debris from a homeowner, essentially mitigating the inside of the house or public building and pushing it to the curb. This debris is separated pretty good because you can see the trash bags that is probably going to the landfill. You have installation, environmental historic preservation may say something about that. If you have insulation that was before 1974, it could be spun with asbestos, so you have to be careful. We have this often in older buildings that have had tornado damage. You just never know what's in the roofs if they are torn apart so be careful of that as well. Then you have vegetative debris off to the side. What is the right of way? The right of way is really you are off the shoulder into the easement. This may help homeowners understand not to put it in your shoulder. That's really it. This is why we put this infographic here in case you want to use this slide to aid yourselves in the community in the recovery. Hand loaded trucks and trucks with no tailgates. FEMA has determined that for vegetative debris, hand-loaded trucks and trailers achieve approximately half the compaction level of mechanically loaded trucks and trailers. Therefore, FEMA only provides public assistance funding for 50% of the vegetative debris and hand-loaded trucks and trailers. Similarly, trucks without solid tailgates cannot be compacted to full capacity. Therefore, FEMA only funds up to a maximum of 85% of the debris in trucks without solid tailgates. The applicant must document the types and total quantity of hand-loaded debris and the types and total quantity of debris hauled in trucks without solid tailgates and provide this information to FEMA to ensure appropriate reductions are taken for this debris. These screenshots are from the Debris Monitoring Guide. I just mentioned truck certification this is very, very important to happen. This is like a cooperating document that has to be filled out in order to ensure that you as the applicant are not being overcharged for the amount of debris that's being removed. Kind of like a DOT certification on a truck when you pick up gravel or something like that from a quarry. And particularly if it's a contractor, not so much a city or county or the local enforcement agencies know that vehicle and know that these trucks belong to this entity. They want to know that the vehicle's capability is within a certification and that's what it's for. Similarly, we use it for knowing how much that vehicle can carry in cubic yardage. And of course, there's also a tonnage rate or a pound rate. So this has to be filled out. This should be done early on, in fact, before disasters for your own fleet, you can fill these out. My recommendation is get with the public works supervisor and in coordination with your risk manager, 
knows the type and make and models of all these trucks. You've probably already done this. Upload a picture of the truck and the VIN number, fill that out, and you'll be ready to go for the next disaster. This is a great document that helps cooperate and will get you ready to go at a moment's notice if you have a debris operation. You know the truck number, you know how much it can carry, and your monitors will have that on a list, and then they can crosswalk this truck certification amount with how much the truck can carry, with however much debris was in the vehicle when it came into the tower, whether at final disposal or at the temporary disposal reduction site. You must have a monitor with a tower at either location, otherwise you're just guessing how much is in the vehicle. On the right hand side is an example of how to measure. It's just simple math. Length times width times height divided by 27 gives you cubic yardage. It also breaks it down with other measurements if you have a cavity within the vehicle. Here is an example of what a load ticket looks like. Every trucking firm, contractor firm, has these. They have to have them in case they get pulled over by an enforcement agency. Typically, they want to know what they're hauling so they know what a load ticket is. We just get more specific with debris load tickets and the client name would be the town of XYZ disaster number. We just make them more specific to aid the communities in maximizing their reimbursement of helping you with your contractors identify the type, the quantity, the size of debris, and the percentage full. These are fantastic tickets to use. One thing we did not talk about, dumping time and date. We had instances where we had duplicate load tickets or we've had the same truck picking up debris within five minutes and they had to go 10 miles so we knew that load tickets were being manipulated. Let's just say that. That's a hard conversation to have because we have to bring in the state because then they'll have to go to the applicant. Most always the applicants are thankful that we saw this activity happen but then what do you do? You have to work with a contractor or remove the contractor. FEMA requires contract debris removal to be monitored with certain information captured. The proper load ticket will help capture this information. The information captured is debris removal location, applicant name, date, disaster name, the load ticket number, truck and driver information, debris quantities, debris type, percentage full, dumping time and date, and then signatures. Now with the advent of technology, you can do these electronically. Electronic load tickets with the QR codes are the way to go because you do not have all this manual data entry and then crosswalking it to an Excel spreadsheet. There's programs out there that do that for you. And FEMA does accept load tickets handwritten or electronic. All the sophisticated debris companies use QR codes, it goes to what they call a data export database. We are very used to them. They're layered documents. They're very easy to cooperate, but we often still find mistakes in them for duplicate load tickets because of a data merge that had duplicated things, or the debris wasn't clearly identified where it went. Things like that do happen. Here's one that looks like a sample load ticket that comes out and their quality control reprinted it for you and then gave it to our program delivery manager so that we can have it sampled on a large project or just have it available in case of further review or audit. If it is a small project, we could talk about that. FEMA's minimum is a million or more to be a large project now. A million or less is a small project done on the Streamline Project application, also known as SPA. But we still look for summary documentation, and you still have to retain all documentation in case of a further audit and review. I highly recommend you keep the load tickets handy, and you do not discard them. Keep them in a database in case of a state audit or something like that. I doubt they would look at the load tickets, but you just never know. We've had the Inspector General at FEMA 
come to our office and want to check out load tickets from time to time and our sampling procedures. So let's talk about how it's filled out. This load ticket number is 50106. The date will be embedded in here electronically. It gives the location of the truck, the truck number, GPS, the time, who the monitor was, the time in, the time out, and the percentage full. This is a fantastic load ticket. Often they are not signed. The reason they are not signed is because of electronic. They're not going to go in and sign every one of those electronically. By our rule of thumb is by submission of the electronic document, you're essentially certifying that the signature on that. And often on hand load tickets, you may see a signature. It's not a big deal. Here, construction and demolition debris, C and D, does not mean they demoed the building on a public assistance building. It could if it was proof for demo. Again, that would be a category B, but while we refer to things as construction and demolition, is it's strewn debris from what the storm demolished, not an actual demolition that was done because the building was 50% or less damaged. Now the homeowner can demolish a building and put it to a curb. That's something you want to pay attention to because if they do, then that's a lot of debris and they most often have insurance to help them with the demolition. C and D debris is just a demolition from the inside, mitigating doing any kind of pickup and strewn debris around the property and putting it at the curb. It is not like a prescribed or planned demolition. So I want to make that distinction. If you have any demolitions of private structures or public structures, please get with your disaster leadership and public assistance to see the criteria are for that. Why is it important for the percentage full to be part of the low ticket information before it goes to the landfill? This gives the landfill monitor an idea of how much the truck was loaded before it left the right of way pickup site. This ensures that the debris hauler is not stopping to load ineligible debris and topping off before going to the landfill for dumping. Fraud Risk Reduction Information For more information on the highest observed fraud risk to public assistant emergency work grant funds with respect to Category A, watch Category A Debris Removal Fraud Risk Profile video. You can search this on YouTube under Fraud Risk Profile. Now we have some closing information for you. To report corruption, waste, fraud, abuse, mismanagement, and or misconduct, contact the Department of Homeland Security Office of Inspector General by phone at 1-800-323-8603 or via the mailing address listed on the screen now. Procurement requirements are among the most complicated parts of the PA grant process and non-compliance can result in de-obligation of funding. Please make sure that you are following FEMA's procurement guidance for recipients and subrecipients. Federal requirements for procurement and contracting are described in 2 CFR Part 200. The Procurement Disaster Assistance Team, or PDAT, offers some training and tools on their website at www.fema.gov slash grants slash procurement. For technical assistance with Grants Portal or Grants Manager, you can call the PA Grants Portal Grants Manager hotline at 866-337-8448. National hours of operation are 8 a.m. through 6 p.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. The hotline can also be reached by email at FEMA-Recovery-PA-Grants at fema.dhs.gov. We have many other recorded webinars and tutorial videos available on our YouTube channel. You can find them by searching for FEMA Grants Portal on YouTube or by navigating to the Support Center in Grants Portal or Grants Manager. Thank you for watching.